Now, the next stage is that in January we will publish an outline national changeover plan, which will set out the practical steps which would be needed if the UK were to choose to join the Euro. Uh, what's this? What? Mr Brown promised more government ads like this one to increase public understanding of the Euro. Euro forums would be held and an all-party group of MPs set up. Yet here at the CBI conference, just one exhibition stand out of more than a hundred from industry all over the country deals with preparing for the Euro. Clearly there are a number of major companies who are well prepared. I think the, the disappointing thing is that small companies aren't as prepared as perhaps they should be. Uh, in many cases they felt that because uh, the, we are not moving into the single currency, certainly in the terms of the first wave, that it wouldn't impact upon them. The single European currency is being adopted by 11 countries. Britain, Sweden, Denmark and Greece are not joining. On January the 1st, 1999, a new European Central Bank will be set up and currencies will be pegged to the euro. At the beginning of 2002, euros will come into circulation. At the end of 2002, national currencies will be withdrawn. This morning, the Prime Minister met the new German Chancellor in London in what some see as the beginning of a new European alliance in which Britain is seen as increasingly moving towards the euro. The Chancellor's main message today was the urgency of preparing for the euro, but he has an even more pressing problem in the short term. Tomorrow in the House of Commons, he'll give his pre-budget statement in which he's expected to say that his forecast for economic growth will have to be cut because of the economic slowdown. John Draper, ITN, at the CBI conference in Birmingham. Well, to our economics editor, Caroline Kerner. Caroline, we're not in yet, but clearly the economic landscape is going to change with the advent of the euro. What effects will we feel here? For most individuals, there won't be an obvious effect. And for those who are affected, they'll be the people who are somewhat on the periphery. But it will be possible for some people to get euro mortgages, for example, which will have much lower interest rates. But I think most lenders will only contemplate giving a euro mortgage to somebody who's paid in euro, so who has a European employer to start with. The impact will be more obvious for business and some of the big UK companies are already trying to persuade their suppliers, whether they're British suppliers or European suppliers, to charge them, to invoice them solely in euros. And that means of course they'll still have to be charging in sterling when they're selling to us, but all their transactions in Europe will be done in a single currency. So they effectively reap the benefits of the single currency, although we're not, not joining. So, so not too much change for individuals here immediately, but if we were having this conversation in, say, Brussels or Paris, things would be very different. Absolutely. They? I mean, or in Dublin either. The fact is, if you're an individual in one of those countries, things are going to change ex at an extraordinary rate. You can do all your transactions that don't involve cash in euros from now on. You can, for example, get a euro mortgage. You can get a euro credit card. That means that you'll suddenly have a huge variety of choices available to you. If you're, say if you're, if you're in Dublin and you're thinking of looking at a mortgage, you can get a mortgage that might be based with a German bank or a Belgian bank or a Spanish bank, whichever is offering you the best deal. So there are huge advantages. You can have your utility bills paid. And for most Europeans, there'll be a kind of long period when they can use all their kind of non-cash transactions in euros. They'll have to wait a couple of years before the euro comes into circulation as a cash transaction but there's, there's still a significant difference to them. And just uh, more immediately, um, we've been talking about interest rates in the euro, but uh, we're expecting some uh, news on interest rates here this week, aren't we? Yes, absolutely. This is a terribly busy week in terms of the economy. The Bank of England meets again this week to decide what to do with UK interest rates. And of course, the Chancellor will be giving his pre-budget report to Parliament when he's expected to confirm that his forecast for economic growth has been revised downwards very sharply, as John Draper said. And it's expected also that he's going to signal his readiness to borrow, to keep up the announcements of, of increased public spending on health and education. Caroline, thanks a lot for that. Up to one and a half thousand people are believed to have been buried alive in a massive mudslide in Nicaragua. Whole villages were engulfed when the slopes of a volcano collapsed in torrential rain in the wake of Hurricane Mitch. The storm is one of the worst ever to hit Central America. Our foreign news correspondent Paul Davis reports. Across Nicaragua, Honduras and El Salvador, it has rained non-stop for days, a torrent that has swept away entire communities. The storm they call Mitch is no longer a hurricane, but no less deadly for that. Its rains have washed away mountainsides, uprooting trees, destroying houses and claiming thousands of lives. Small towns and villages have been flooded or worse still completely buried beneath tons of mud. 
It's feared the heaviest loss of life has been suffered in the mountains of northern Nicaragua. Normally remote, now accessible only by helicopter, after dozens of mudslides that have buried dozens of villages. The survivors, picked up by rescue teams, have said it was as if their mountain had exploded. A wall of mud crashing down onto the village, burying everything and everyone. Only a handful of people survived. There were similar tragic stories in El Salvador. For every villager picked from the flood water or dug out from the mud, many others are still missing. The death toll mounting with every hour. Rescue efforts have been made almost impossible by the same deadly mud that has swept away road links to the devastated areas. Paul Davis, ITN. Here fears are growing for the safety of a young woman who went missing after a night out at the weekend. Jennifer King, who's 22, hasn't been seen since she left Chaser's nightclub in Bristol in the early hours of Saturday. The venue is just a few miles from where another woman, Melanie Hall, disappeared to the people. The charity has been criticised for using shock tactics, but it says the real scandal is that so many older people are still dying in Britain during the winter. Philippa Young reports. In Liverpool this lunchtime, 85-year-old Ron Sanford and his wife Rose, who's 79. Cold weather payments will help with a contribution to their heating bills, but they're preparing for a cold winter. Uh, oh, the cold man's going to come and he's going to want uh, 35 or 40 pounds for a, a few bags of coal. I mean, the price of the, uh, of the fuel is, uh, is, uh, is a problem. So you've got to watch what you're doing with your money. Despite government help with heating bills, pensioners groups say many elderly people find it a struggle to keep themselves warm. Help the Aged says 20,000 elderly people will die this winter because of the cold. The latest warning campaign was unveiled today and already there's concern they've gone too far. Lined up are eight bodies on mortuary slabs. A shocking image, but one age concern says is justified. We're not frightened by controversy. We believe the time is right to bring this to the public fore. We decided to do it. We believe that the facts themselves are far more shocking than this post.